Oh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Gerhard Kasper, and I guess the way I should identify myself is I'm still the president of the American Academy <laughs> uh, in Berlin. Uh, as some of you may have read, heard, uh, uh, we announced the appointment of a new president today who will take office on August 15. And uh, I think this is a great event uh, for the humanities and the arts uh, because uh, Michael Steinberg, a professor at Brown University, uh, comes with a deep background uh, in the arts. He is a historian, but in particular also a music historian, and he has done German studies, and he has published about literature, and about the Salzburg Festival, and so uh, the American Academy will take a distinct turn in the direction of the arts and its commitment to the humanities. <coughs> I was instructed today not to do what I normally do when these events take place uh, at the Wannsee, and so I will not. However, I want to uh, just quote one sentence from Ernst Gombrich, the great art historian, and his story of art, because I think what I'm going to quote now, and I, I have always been a great admirer of this, what I'm going to quote now has relevance for the evening. Uh, he said, there in, at the beginning of his story of art, this unsurpassed history of art, he said, there really is no such thing as art. There are only artists. I think we will see. <laughs> Guten Abend, meine Damen und Herren. Ich bin Professor Kernisch. Uh, I'm not going to give an introduction. I'm just going to talk about Carol. There are 17 images. I showed them to her and she said it's okay. She's a very conscientious fellow and a very understated woman. She really is specialising in avoiding anything that is without necessity or tautness, as she has frequently discussed with Hamza, uh, Hamza Walker, Hamza Walker, uh, from the Renaissance Society at the University of Chicago. If you do not know this space, it's uh, one of the oldest contemporary art exhibition spaces in America, and it's still one of the most important uh, exhibition spaces in the world, it's tucked away in a, in a fourth floor of a humanities building in the middle of the University of Chicago campus. If I was to proffer an institutional equivalent to Carroll, it would be the Wren under, the, um, under Suzanne Goetz's uh, stewardship. She's sort of understating, but with a complexity and intelligence that is expansive, and there are times when I have very little contact with her because she was, was on a religious kind of, kind of work binge almost, as if she was going to be a missionary in terms of work. It's like a form of meditation. So meditation is a very wonderful thing and it's very non-aggressive. However, when it becomes something which you feel is going to make the world a better place, then it's better to keep it for yourself rather than to propagate. Carol met um, Rinpoche Trungpa in the early 80s as well as Allen Ginsberg and others at the Naropa Institute in Boulder, Colorado when she was, um, had come back from living in the Philippines and Japan when the NPA and MNLF and the Marcos regime were coming undone. She was at the Malakanyang Palace after they left to see the half-eaten toast and freeze-dried coffee left on the table. It was, was nearly a textbook case for a socialist movement across 7,500 islands, only 2,000 of which are occupied. That says a lot including how an eight-hour film, A Lullaby to the Sorrowful, Sorrowful Mystery by Love Diaz, 
can have a theatrical release across multiplexes in the Philippines and fill the houses. Um, so I, uh, I remember the visit together with uh, Blinky Palermo, who by now is a kind of myth, interesting, wonderful, romantic artist. He's, he's almost like a John Prine type of person. And his name, Blinky Palermo, is a pseudonym uh, that was given to him by a student of Boyce because he had a kind of a, of a scar face and, and he was very kind of timid person and a loner, but one with a strong inner life. He was, he was born as Peter Schwarzer and then he and his twin brother were adopted and he became Hans Peter Heistenkamp, which was a kind of not very interesting name and Boyce said, you know, maybe you should pick a name and then the fellows can call him Blinky Palermo who was named after the organised crime figure in Chicago who surreptitiously owned prize fighters and was a boxing promoter and, um, and because he had a kind of elegance about him. Now, I remember Carol, who I often remember in relation to Stan um, uh, Brackage, because I recognised her at previous times as a filmmaker. She learned to be a filmmaker, that was her trade, and she was recommended by artists. She became very interested in what other artists were doing and she was very reliant and the work was not expensive and she shot a lot of films in the 80s, but whatever she took was very useful for her own work and um, every so often for others. So artists liked her to make films. I remember I was introduced to Carol by Hubert Winter and Walter Holzer, Holzer pardon me, who kind of were being a post-service patron and, and they said, if you need an artist, she's not expensive now, she's very reliable and you don't have to tell her what to do because she's much better than what you would have to tell her what to do, which is true. Now, now she's a very... Um, Excuse me. She's a very tall fellow. She has a slight lisp and uh, as told to me by a Latino music promoter, but I don't hear it. And she's about this size and that also meant that she probably had a very tough childhood and being kind of teased as a kid for being so tall, <laughs> she has a very different kind of dignity about herself. Yeah. She can be distant but is communicative and civil and she's friendly but there's nothing unnecessary to fill the gaps. So if you're insecure, you may misread this. I remember, for instance, there was a performance of Yvonne, Yvonne Rayner's um, and Robert Morris's at the Academy. At, at, at the time, we did not live in Germany, but we would visit. And I would make sure to go there and make sure to follow certain things that would interest me, and she was there. So I recognised her. She's a very recognisable woman, and the fact that, because that was mentioned, that she was at an exhibition... There was this very famous exhibition when attitude becomes form and that was more in a morphological sense. You walk in and see a work by Fred, Fred Sandbach and you see an Iglo work of Mario Mertz or a work of Barry Flanagan which is about sand and it's about being tactile, it's about hard, it's about soft, it's very much about physics. Carol's work could also be considered being about physics, and the particles may be irreducible to their constituent elements as an unsuspecting material or act. Hence, this is how it's possible for her to, to understand complex systems and structures that, for example, would make it possible to obtain the trademark for nothing as the extension of her performance uh, piece of the same title. A work from 2004 when she went to Argentina for an exhibition, spent six weeks walking out her front door with absolutely nothing except for the clothes on her back and her passport, wherein every encounter became 
part of the performance. Or it would be the policy works related to the built environment, most notably prototype 180 started in 1999 or public utility 2.0 that treats unused television spectrum as a form of 21st century land art, albeit it is the national spectrum and not the Great Salt Lake in Utah. Or even the doppelganger tapes that started in Veen at Freud's house in 2000 during the political protest against Jörg Haider. So Carol started these works in order to duplicate the presence and political action in order to look over the wall, so to speak, as having more than one of something as a replication or copy makes the thing, and in the Heideggerian sense of the thing, more of itself. So as I started to say, um, I would talk about Mary Ellen Carroll, and now it's time for a talk by Mary Ellen Carroll. So without further delay, um, I present Mary Ellen Carroll. That is enough of your Haida. Please remove the slide. I would like to personally thank the professor for whose words, for those words, and all of you for coming out for the talk this evening, some as far as Texas. Barack Obama in his acclaimed campaign speech discussing the troubling complexities of race in America today, quoted William Faulkner's famous remark as, the past isn't dead and buried, in fact, it isn't even past. It is surprising, or perhaps prudent, that the Faulkner estate did not have their legal team sue our president as they have sued others in the past for misquoting that countlessly utilized quote. The law is a material I use frequently. And there is a work that paradoxically is already completed and waiting to be realized, in part through the international trademark and copyright that I have for nothing, so it necessitates no further discussion this evening. In fact, I've hired a firm to scrub it from the internet. Good evening. It is an honor to be the Guana S. Montheim Artist Fellow at the American Academy in Berlin and a privilege to be in residence with such a notable and talented group of individuals, some of which are academics and some of which have humors, in addition to their partners, spouses, and their children. Gerd Kasper's leadership of the Academy is exceptional, and I only wish that I was teaching in the D School at Stanford when he was there in order to further expand their process of design thinking. I would also like to extend my gratitude to the board members and supporters of the Academy, and most importantly, to the remarkable staff who make everything possible including the new studio that will allow me to realize a series of paintings and photographs on Berlin and on the architecture of asylum that I started in the 80s in the Philippines. The Academy's attention to detail also includes this evening. It is being held here at the Kennedys, in part because of the research I started at the Kennedy Library on the architecting of state visits as both a method of surveillance and of counter-surveillance, or to put it more simply, as a method to see and to be seen. What is more important is the chronicling of the narration of the adjacencies to the political movements, trade deficits, and post-war policies between the US and Germany, and specifically Berlin, and how this knowledge is made. I'm grateful to the owners and staff of this private institution for their collection of images and films from President Kennedy's visit to Berlin um, from June 26, 1963, and the additional artifacts from his life that they acquired and put on display. 
I encourage you to spend some time with these, and if not this evening, to return. Even to look at the costume exhibited. A white shirt that was custom made as a double skin to eliminate its transparency. My work as a conceptual artist primarily occupies the disciplines of architecture, design, and public policy, performance and film, and oftentimes utilizes unsuspecting materials that might not be visible as a law, intellectual property, political organizing, and policy. Every work begins in language. Teaching, writing, lecturing, and public presentations are an important part of my work, and the educational institutions have included the Architecture School and Political Science Department at Rice University in Houston, the Graduate School of Architecture, Planning, and Preservation at Columbia University in New York, Princeton University School of Architecture in New Jersey, Busan National University's Department of Planning in South Korea, and University of California at Irvine School of Art. Voted for the war in Iraq. Everyone knew there was no evidence whatsoever. How does a drag queen who knows nothing about uh, any CIA dossiers, have no access to anything, know that it was not connected to 9-11 whatsoever? You know, now we're faced with her as Obama's heir presumptive. And she's going to, to pitch herself as a hawk. Actually, so wishy-washy. I mean, she's like, oh, what policy is going to stick? In 1991, at the start of the Persian Gulf War, I wrote the following note. We are living in a political epoch and everything is about policy. Who gets to participate in the process of making policy? There are your personal policies, the policy of the workplace and the government, the community and so on. Policy is a material. This evening, I will present work by other artists as well as by those who contribute to the cultural realm alongside four, of project, four projects of mine, providing an overview over my work that occupies architecture and public policy, all of which begin with and privilege the local through collaboration and participation. So in effect, they are, but are not, my own. The duration of the projects and their sustainability are important and necessary considerations, even if a project exists only temporarily. The stewardship of the work, how it resonates in the present as well as anticipating how it will continue into the future, is always a component. Prototype 180 is my ongoing opus that was started in 1991 in Houston, Texas. It utilizes the land use policy, or the lack thereof, as a material to make architecture perform. Public Utility 2.0 utilizes policy and technology to architect radio frequencies for the public, creating open source broadband connectivity. Number 18 utilizes a uniquely Korean economic policy to make visible the private as public space in Busan, South Korea, to architect a terraced park system and an architectural insertion <laughs> that retrofitted a post-war housing block into a broadcasting center. And finally, you will hear about the Circle, circle Game, my most recent commission from us, Alza Kal Avenue, that opened on March 16th in the Emirate of Dubai, and makes the city visible to itself as a future conditional. One morning, during breakfast at the Academy, before leaving to give a talk at the Putlitzer Foundation for the Arts in St. Louis, I was asked why I was going to St. Louis. Michelle Lowry, who teaches classics at the University of Chicago and is doing work on the origins of security, and Brenda Stevenson, who is a UCLA professor of history in African American studies and focuses on the history of slavery and African American women, were both there. Brenda mentioned 
the riots of 1917 in St. Louis and how they left an indelible mark on the city and how thousands of men had to leave the city and it was women <coughs> and children who remained and with limited opportunities for employment, hence the cycle of poverty and draconian laws that continues to this day. There was a plate of cheese and dried fruit on the table and I proceeded to explain how the fate for St. Louis was already sealed in 1876 when the city separated from the county and basically became its own county. I explained that the city was like the center of the saucer or the middle of a donut. I then explained that the parameter or the actual donut was like the cheese and fruit that would be part Municipal, be in part municipalities where there was home rule and in part part, the, um, part of the county. And since policy enabled the county to determine where a great deal of the resources would go and to whom, this resulted in inequities and systemic discrimination and racism and unequal distribution of resources that impacted the city and its center and that this policy created and contributed to the current state of the city, including Ferguson and the death of Michael Brown. A border was drawn between the city of St. Louis and St. Louis County, plus the suburbs. The county assiduously avoided any responsibility for mixed income or public housing or urban renewal, which further transformed the border between St. Louis and St. Louis County into what is described as a Berlin Wall between city and county, the poor and the affluent, and the black and the white. And so it continues. And it's that magnificent group known as Roar running down the body slicks town. We think it's one of the baddest things around. It's one they call Bayero. above a certain age, you may recall encountering screens filled with static. As you flip through the higher channels of ultra high frequency and very high frequency to watch a program such as Dark Shadows, Mary Hartman, Mary Hartman, or Soul Train, one of the first African-American syndicated television shows that started airing on this slice of spectrum on October 2nd. 1971. A program that is in effect taught, that in effect taught people moves in Atlanta, Cleveland, Detroit, Houston, Los Angeles, Philadelphia and San Francisco, cities with significant African American populations. But the program and the manner in which it was <coughs> developed and distributed was more political than it seems. It started with the voice of the bass baritone host, Don Cornelius, introducing the performers who had auditioned to be on this variety show. Because they could not afford to consistently have nationally famous musicians, the like of Chaka Khan, Stevie Wonder, David Bowie, etc., and their genres of jazz, R&B, funk, and disco performed live, Cornelius and staff instead trusted in the participants to draw audience members in, instructing them to perform with necessitated extroversion. <clears throat> the Underground Railroad was writ large as the African-American youth who were recruited from high schools danced across the painted railroad tracks and into the living rooms of millions of homes in America, wherein they inadvertently proffered instruction and a soft form of race relations via this radio frequency. 
Aside from his troubled personal life and behavior, Cornelius understood and had fortuitous timing for the dissemination and distribution of his show. He had the Johnson Company as a sponsor. In 1971, the US government regulatory agency, the Federal Communications Commission, enacted a policy that ordered the networks to open prime time slots to the affiliates of the major networks to program their own shows, thereby representing the local audience. It was expensive to produce a weekly show, and this is how the syndication of a show like Soul Train benefited, as did the entire country. It is possible to see how the Soul Train and how the network for TV is an early model for what we see being architected for di digital two-way transmission today with super Wi-Fi, and how this can be utilized as a system for production and distribution not only within the art world but within the world. I will return to this. Politically active during the Vietnam War and against it. Seth Siegelaub and the lawyer Robert Projansky developed the seminal document, the Artists Reserved Right Transfer and Sale Agreement, also referred to as the Artists Contract. It was the realization of a project initiated in 1970. Siegelaub curtailed his activities in the art world in 1972. This early draft of the artist contract evidences his trust in the artist and what is invaluable to point out, it suggests that the artist is to basically separate him or herself from everyone else, to singularize, to separate from groups and from the system of evaluation and from how the work of art is perceived. Sieglaub understood the politics of making art and how it is necessary to use insurgent materials that ultimately raise important questions about the entire ecosystem, from conceptualization to the process of the making of the work of art, all the way through to its sale or destruction. He also interrogated the methods for communicating that process, and this was, to his mind, analogous to a political act. This process is also utilized by the video artist Charles Atlas. And when describing his 2015 exhibition and the political nature of his title, The Waning of Justice, Atlas said that the world should end and then there should be a disco song. He also stated in an interview that I am not political. I do not make political pieces, but it's the mood. Following his collaboration with the artist Lee Bowery, Atlas had another drag queen on his I want to work with list of collaborators. This was Lady Bunny. I wanted to talk a little bit about my parents growing up in Chattanooga, Tennessee, as I did, and they uh, became radicalized when they went to, went to took the whole family to West Africa, to Ghana, where my dad had a Fulbright teacher teaching scholarship. I don't know if I can talk. And uh, they met Quakers, and my parents became Quakers and very much interested in peace. My father was always interested in politics. I never was. Politics was always the thing that made him watch Watergate while the Brady Bunch was canceled. So I despised politics and always thought that that was a man's thing and that I had no part in it. But as I grow up <laughs> and out, I found my you know, voice talking about politics because it seems like so many times the right questions aren't being asked. And, you know, the one of the loudest voices for peace was when Jon Stewart had that, I welcome Democrats and Republican, but let's have a big rally for peace. And sadly, peace is, a, is not an option.
For the last 10 years, Lady Bunny has been blogging and articulates a very limpid perspective on what ails, on what ails the US as well as the world. Lady Bunny, who has not been in a political mood, but in an instrumentalized political mode, transmits through her blog and other appearances. We can infer that her views are those shared by Charles Atlas in the work The Waning of Justice, wherein Atlas actually is making a political work and thereby is being political. And unless we mobilize, as we did with uh, Occupy Wall Street, unless we stand up and say, no, you are not going to oppress us, you are not going to take our money to uh, go and fight a war with it. No, you are not going to racially profile us. No, you're not going to rape us. No, you're not going to dictate what goes on in our vagina. You know, until we actually stand up to them, they're going to just keep getting away with murder. They own all of the, uh, the major media. Lady Bunny becomes the interlocutor for both Occupy Wall Street and Charles Atlas. Thus she makes a political audible within the art world and specifically within a commercial gallery. This is no small feat. Her translation allows their singularities to be visible. Charles Atlas understood this and therein lies the intelligence of this work. It is important that you have an understanding of context of this video of Lady Bunny made by Atlas in relation to the rest of his work and how it is exhibited. All of the elements were synchronized by imagery, the duration and soundtrack to create one dynamic visual experience. The exhibition at Luring Augustine Gallery consisted of two rooms, one which contained sunsets that Atlas shot when he was in residence on two occasions at the Robert Rauschenberg Foundation in Captiva, Florida. Atlas describes himself as being urban and not particularly interested in nature. But the sun was setting and visible from his bedroom, as was Bob Rauschen that was Bob Rauschenberg's bedroom. I know this as it too was my bedroom when I was invited to be a fellow there. The sunset videos also have a time code video in the center of the room that is a counter indicating the 18 minutes it takes for the sun to set. Atlas collaborated on the soundtrack with a young London noise musician Luke Younger who goes by the name of Helm. Even when Lady Bunny is intentionally muted <coughs> It is not a technology issue. At moments during the larger-than-life performance, the slices of silent audio amplify her rant, as she calls it, or her discussion of the contributing causes to Occupy Wall Street or the Black Lives Matter movements, making them even more audible. Occupy was actually start, started the moment when the Occupy Wall Street ORG web address was registered on June 9, 2011, by the Estonian-born Kalle Lazen from Adbusters, a Canadian anti-consumerist organization, and not on September 17, 2011, when Sukoti Park was occupied. Unfortunately, the access is limited to this still frame, a single image of binary code that is trademarked as a JPEG for the Joint Photographic Experts Group, who created the standard. As an aside, it is worth noting that Skype is also Estonian-born and was acquired by Microsoft on May 9, 2011 for $8.5 billion in an all-cash deal. Occupy Wall Street ended in November 2011 when New York City Mayor Mike Blomberg ordered the disassembly and cleanup of Tsukoti Park, citing health and safety reasons, a reasoning which we all know was not accurate. Tsukoti Park, renamed from Liberty Park in honor of the chairman of Brookfield Properties, is a private park. It was chosen as a site to be occupied because, unlike city parks, it does not close at night. 
These private parks were part of New York City zoning expansion policy from 1961 that gave real estate developers one square foot of vacant space at the base of a building for each 10 square feet of bonus floor area made available for rent or sale. And now we've got two parties that represent war after Obama won a Nobel Peace Prize. Now we're back in Iraq, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Syria, and looks like we're headed towards Yemen and maybe Iran. So I'm just worried that neither party represents peace, and the American people have clearly said they want peace. And I think that everyone would like to live in, everyone who's not making money for war would like to live in a time of peace and prosperity. So if the craziness of this can get a message to you, I don't understand where the greed uh, that is causing the war, I don't understand where the greed that is killing the planet, the only planet that we have to live on, is coming from. Because the people in charge... Occupy knew its land use policy in their zoning code for New York City, and which location for, for the natural was actually artificial. It was Sukkoti Park, and it could be occupied. Atlas, in essence, also wanted the artificial to be natural or unfamiliar in order for the political to be made visible and audible. Loring Augustine Gallery and Charles Atlas generously provided a copy of The Waning of Justice for this lecture for educational purposes. It couldn't be sourced from the internet because even a 10 second video clip was scrubbed. It is not only celebrities and hedge funds who employ the services of PR or other firms offering content cleaning services. It is also the government. Recently, oh God, this is so insane. I can barely even get into it. But Obama is pushing something called the Trans-Pacific Partnership, which they call NAFTA on steroids. This is going to destroy Lots of jobs for decades to come. This translation and distanciation makes a subjective objective. And drag is what makes it possible. Ironically, the mode of distribution of this work by Atlas to be acquired from the ga gallery as an addition video allows it to become visible only at the moment of the failure of its political autonomy. As a Korean-born German philosopher Byung-Chul Han notes in his work Transparency, singularity is abandoned when it finds expression through capital and the price alone. Money, which makes it possible to equate anything with anything else, abolishes all incommensurability and all singularity. There are countless other methods of distribution and dissemination for this work that mirror the political capital it created, but this was not a consideration. In 1999, I was teaching at the University of California at Irvine, and I had just lectured to my students in a critical theory course on narrative. For once, there was an indication, following a lecture and discussion from Gertrude Stein's text on narration, that they were thinking. If I missed the 15-minute window to get on the 405 freeway, it would take three to four hours to get home. On November 27, I wrote the following statement while I was stuck in that four hours of traffic. To make a conceptual work of art whose process will make architecture perform as a work of art in this age of the political and to treat policy itself as a material, the catalytic moment will be the revolution of a structure and its surrounding property 180 degrees. 
Following the rotation, everything about the building and its surroundings as a system will be reconsidered and, if necessary, retrofitted, redesigned and manufactured. It could be anywhere in the world, but knowing that the policy question was the foundation of this work, it became evident where it would be. Houston, Texas. Houston, Texas self selected itself as it is the only city in the US without a formal land use policy or no zoning. In 2000, I started the work in earnest and began to go to Houston and map the city. <laughs> I said I knew that it would be this city, but I did not know the exact location. There were certain parameters, I will not go into detail here, but what we were looking at is what was not being looked at. People pay attention to the very high and the very low. But the policy blind spots and the stabilizing factors in most societies are when you go from the lower end to the start of the middle class. And these are the aging first ring post-war de developments that exist in almost every city in the world. I was doing research on these areas and the development of financing mechanisms and where first home buyers could access VHA or FHA financing. Sharpstown was such a development started by Frank Sharp, who was a crook, by the way. <laughs> That's all great, but it doesn't matter if there's no jobs. September of 2001, I started working with Betty Towns of Sharpson Realty. I was using TerraServer from the US, USGS that was pre-Google Maps to look at properties that had public land on two sides of the property. We drove down Sharp View Drive in Houston and I saw this property and had her stop. She said it was not for sale and I replied that this was going to be the site. It was a house that had not been inhabited for over 13 years, 6513 Sharp View. The public land would be the city or street on the north side and a county park called Bayland Park at the south side. Bayland Park, which is a much beloved park that has ball fields, that was at the back of the property that would eventually be the front of the property. I sent a certified letter to the owner of that property, AIC <laughs> Management, who also happened to own many other uninhabited houses. And eventually I met an individual named Dr. Kapoor, who held a doctorate in engineering. Needless to say, it is never a good thing to negotiate with someone when they know you're, you desire something that they own or have. The first thing that I did was to review the deed restrictions for the area to meet with the civic association who enforces the deed restrictions to make sure that everything that we wanted to do would be legally possible. It was. We also started to maintain the property as a gesture of goodwill towards the neighborhood. That was in 2005, four years before our LLC became owned, owner of the property. Since 2001, I have done extensive programming, and this included staging a mayoral, mayoral forum with the mayoral candidates at the Contemporary Arts Museum in Houston in 2006, the year that included the former mayor, Anise Parker. And it is worth noting one of the first openly gay elected mayors of a major city and in Texas. The forum was on land use, and the first question that the candidates were to give a yes or no answer to, something that is nearly impossible for politicians to do, was whether they would support zoning. It has been tried to create zoning laws in Houston four times, and it has never passed. 
as there all are extensive real estate development interests in the city and there is a wildcatting mentality of the market determining where things need to be. It is free enterprise. Every candidate said no. I also began to teach at Rice University where the Dean of the Architecture School, Lars Lerup, and his associate dean, John Casabarian, who knew about Prototype 180, asked myself and my colleague and good friend, the architect Charles Renfro of Dillers, Cofidio and Renfro, to teach an endowed graduate architectural studio. Our studio was based on how ideological shifts affect building typology. Essentially, how basketball stadiums can become mega churches. The one thing that I started that studio with is a statement that architecture is inherently a political act, no matter if it is public or private or institutional and at whatever scale. It was also to have the students understand that policy is a material and that the design process is informed by the political one. There can still be formal considerations derived from this process, but similar to when Werner Herzog literally built the ship to push over the hill in the making of Fitzcarraldo, rather than CGI it or make a model, when it is done for real, it smells different. We started to map the area with the students and the community and utilize GIS, Geographical Internet Systems. This was done in order for the area not only to make itself visible to itself, but also to start to take advantage of federal and city programs that included retrofitting as a design tool and also stabilizing properties through weatherization, solar, education, voters' rights and internet connectivity. The property was finally acquired and the closing took place on July 7, 2009, almost 10 years after the concept's realization. The 180 degree revolution took place on November 11, 2010, and this was not without drama when the foundation collapsed where the structure was two meters, when the structure was two meters off the ground for the move. This foundation, of course, had to be removed. You can see the empty lot that goes from the city to the county or public to public. The re revolution was streamed live over a wireless system that I envisioned in 2001 that would only have been possible with satellites. It was a good thing that the process took the time it did as the internet made it possible for my engineering colleagues at Rice University to develop usable streaming, a usable streaming system. This is the aerial view when the structure was reconnected to the new foundation in 2011. This is the final movement of the surrounding acreage as the land was also moved. On October 27, 2015, we transferred the entity from an LLC to a 501c3. Part of the reason it took so long was that we were caught in a deluge of Tea Party applicants who were overwhelming the IRS. I will not go into the financing of this tonight, as that is intentional, but it was important for the process to go from an LLC to a public entity and for purposes, purposes of making that part of the process visible and who supports it. The LLC was called OFPC, and the acronym stood for Out for a Pack of Cigarettes, and perhaps never coming back. This is a Google view that I did earlier today. Since that time, 3,579 people have been involved in prototype 180. Distribution and dissemination of the work was always a consideration of the work and an important aspect. 
The first exhibitions, exhibition of Prototype 180 was at the request of Mark Wigley, Dean of Columbia University's Graduate School of Architecture and Planning and Preservation, who has also been in residence at the American Academy in Berlin, together with Beatrice Colomina, the architectural historian teaching at Princeton, another Academy Fellow. It was of this exhibition at Columbia's Boyle Hall that Holland Cotter from the New York Times wrote, like many performances, Prototype 180 is a critically exaggerated and transforming vision of life. It demonstrates, among other things, that urban space is never a passive environment, that rootedness and belonging are or can be resilient real, uh, resilient real realities, that architecture can be socially proactive. Prototype 180 is still ongoing, and this image and the next are the renderings of the propositions for the park and its rebuilding and retrofitting as a public space. The site will be um, able to study itself as institute on aging post-World War II first ring developments, or it may remain as a landscape that extends the city into the county and the county to the city. It is a question of stewardship. If you don't believe in God, it's about a transferal of, you know, wealth. And I just think that the that that the poor don't really have a voice, and m many more of us are becoming poor. And don't think these governments don't learn from each other. I mean, when you cut heating subsidies, as we did in the Obama administration, for seniors in Maine, well, that's called it's austerity in Europe. And they've been in the streets protesting this in London, Portugal, and Greece. And what austerity basically means is take the poorest people and hit them again, hit them again harder. Prototype 180 is ongoing and things happen when they need to. The next part of the process will be the removal of the structure. And this will be done through a controlled burn leaving the residue of ash that will eventually disappear unless it is gathered and preserved in some manner. In terms of process and questions of materiality in the work of art, this process will not be dissimilar, if it happens at all, to the piece Blizzard Balls by the exceptional artist David Hammonds. In 1983, he set up a kilim on the street in Brooklyn and arranged snowballs for sale, thus creating a system for display and exchange that is emblematic of his use of materials that have no value and the context whereby they become invaluable. Another artist who works with systems of trade and in art market in another manner altogether is Sarah Mayohas a young New York-based artist who attended the Wharton School of Business at the University of Pennsylvania before Yale, where she received her MFA. She has created something called Bitcoin, modeled after Bitcoin. Bitcoin is a digital currency backing her own photography. It is set up at a fixed exchange rate of one Bitcoin to 25 square inches of photographic print. This rate of exchange will not change even if the value of the photography increases. As her work changes in value over time, so will the relative value of Bitcoin. Meyohas realized another work titled Stock Performance, in which she considers the market as a medium constituted of its own limitations. Trading is not performed in discrete batches of time, it is per performed in continuous time. The stock gives direction to time in the line, and in so doing gives a valuation and occurrence, a historical temporal <coughs> temporality. In its concept, sensuous and abstract, Time is the line that the spirit can only try to grasp, and in doing so, it temporalizes temporality. 
as it is divided and further subdivided, time reaches its physical limit, which is beyond human experience. With automated trades, any quote I see is long gone in the market. There's always a distinction between looking here now at a stock there then. This line runs the 720 miles between Chicago and New York. It, its endpoints are right next to the data centers of the stock exchanges. It is a tunnel containing dark fiber which conveys information in the form of light pulses. It was built as, a straight, as straight as possible, bringing the round trip from 16 milliseconds down to 13 milliseconds. Those three milliseconds cost $300 million. It was built in 2010, but it is already obsolete. Microwaves have gotten closer to the theoretical minimum of 7.5 milliseconds, the line of sight. The tunnel, though, remains in the land through mountains and under rivers as a straight testament to market competition. On May 13th, 30, 2014, Mayor Haas bought and sold shares of Golden Enterprises, Inc. This line is a performance of the stock, its price throughout the day. By the scale of her trades, Mayor Haas pushed the market cap of the company up and down between $52 million and $57 million. Mayahas traded Golden Enterprises with complete disregard to its fundamentals as an Alabama-based snack foods company. She traded it because of its name and because nobody else was doing so. Any change in the performance of the stock would be my performance, she said, and executed trades at precisely 20-minute intervals to delineate her intentions. She saw it as a line first, then a stock. This irrational human gesture remains in all the many public financial records of the stock's performances as a horizon. Number 18. The outside never reveals what is happening on the inside. To return to the asking of questions, I next want to discuss the work number 18 that is still ongoing and that began as a commission for the Busan Biennale in South Korea in 2012 under the artistic direction of Roger Bürgel and with the curatorial participation of Ruth Noack. Number 18 began with the question, what is Korean? This was in regards to the city of Busan and the built environment and in the context of the framework of the Biennale. Given the history of the country and how it became the econo economic engine, not only in the region but also in the world, only recently, city planning and building was done out of necessity. The majority of the structures were cast in place in concrete, an, in, in, an inexpensive and fast method that was familiar to the region, notably Japan. There is no Korean modernism or typology that would be identifiable as Korean per se, but what did develop and was both an economic and social cultural platform was a uniquely Korean financing structure, the John Se. Economists love to write about this. John C. is, in effect, to cut a long story short, a pawn shop for real estate. I utilize the system as a structure and foundation of the work number 18. What I did was to take the monies, monies from the commission for the Biennale for the project and enter into John C. contract in a post-war housing block, thus ensuring that I would have some type of financial gain following the end of the Biennale, a rarity if work does not go into the market. The research also looked at and chronicled the building typology, the high-rise apartment building, the wayfinding in large stenciled characters, and the extensive use of CCTV cameras, all of which ubiquitous in South Korea. We developed the following categories for the research. For example, engaging with the history that chronicled 
called the relationship between the US and Korea in policy. For example, chronicling the work 30 minutes more campaign. While the rest of the world is trying to work less, this is not the case in Korea. Once again, the mapping and site were important to the work and this area, Jerevaeon, was that was above the port. This is the site where most Koreans fled during the Korean War and lived in these informal settlements. Eventually, the government partnered with private construction companies to these hilltop high rises that people would own if they transferred the property they had on the hillside to the city. It was this housing block that my John Say contract was made. There was also a research project on apartment blocks and public housing typology that was done with students in the planning and architecture program at Busan National University. They also worked on number 18 as part of my teaching engagement there. Another part of the program was the performance of the buildings and the use of concrete and terracing along the coast and how the artificial became natural with the waterproofing of the roofs. We looked at how it would be possible to create a terrace system that would provide insulation and be low maintenance. I want to bring up one thing about gardens, and in particular in areas where people are working two or three jobs in order to take care of themselves and their families. Frequently, there is the suggestion of the vegetable garden. But these require a great deal of work and maintenance, and oftentimes people that have to work not, do not have time to take care of the vegetables. We were conscious of this and decided that the gardens would be as low maintenance as possible. We also decided that it was important to create a system that could be repeated. For this, I'm grateful to Dao, to da, to Dao and, and Dao, as the work proved to be a great influence on the system we created. Here's a model that is a massing study of the apartment block with the architectural insertion and the terrace roof gardens that would be leading down to the port area. <coughs> These are the roofs that were identified as possible sites for the gardens. But before any of this could happen, there was a question of weight. Would the existing, would the existing construction hold under the weight of the soil? This is where science came in, and the collaboration with landscape designer, artist Simone Frazier and Peter Park, who knew the soil scientist, Paul Mankiewicz, and the farmer, John Heitzman, who developed something called Gaia soil. This soil is 1 20th of the weight of average soil, as it is comprised of styrofoam and compost. We workshopped Gaia soil production in Busan and in Gvevecion and started to manufacture it in Busan for number 18. This was the first site for the gardens and you can see the grid system we developed. We used sedum as they are a plant that requires very little water and maintenance as well as hibiscus which is the nat national flower of South Korea. One thing that was important is that the entire community not only witnessed the extent of the work being done, but actively participated in it. This was the way in which trust and mutual understanding were developed in the process. This is the final planting that, is established, that established a model that would be replicated on other rooftops. There was also an issue with lighting and wayfinding in the area and this LED sign functioned doubly as a light source and as a visible marker for the piece. As you can see, the building is number one, but the sign says number 18. An anecdote is that this amused the locals immensely to have another number of a building than the actual address that translates as shiphole or 18, which means shit. As in, oh shit, this is the wrong place, etc. An architectural model was made to represent the John C. and the architectural insertion. 
You can see from the plan where the insertion was placed and that it measured four square pyong, a Korean measurement that was outlawed but is still in use and is the equivalent of a body with its arm and legs stretched out. It was decided to design the space in a manner that would utilize an off-site construction method that was modular and looked at showy screens and tatami mats that were also part of the traditional Korean house. This is the material that was selected for the construction, both because of its insulating properties, but also so, so that it could be recycled into Gaia soil and reused in the gardens if and when it would be taken down, just like the snowballs. It was set up as a sarabang, which translated, it leads to something between a television studio and a kitchen table. A CCTV system was live 24-7 and provided a live high-definition video and audio feed to the museum as well as being viewable on the internet. Given the amount of space that the kitchens take in most Korean homes, we also designed this movable kitchen that could um, be located anywhere in the space. This is Stephen Henderson who realized the cooking for others at the space. The Busan Modern Art Museum, which was the main site for the Biennale. There was also an exact replica of the LED sign in the museum as what was installed on the exterior of the site in Gervation. The residents, none of whom had ever been to a museum, came to see the exhibition and the work that they contributed to. The work on display in the museum was a reenactment or dissemination, and this included the models, the live video, and audio feed from number 18. Programming at number 18 was both formal and informal and ranged from the architect Min Suk Cho, a leading architect who has a firm mass studios in Seoul and actually grew up in one of these housing blocks. And it included Mrs. Bang Ban Sung Lee, who was 83 and had been a resident since the buildings were constructed in 1963. She was a regular at number 18 and conducted interviews with her neighbors to create an oral history of the area. Buddhist monks, students, politicians, K-pop stars. There was no distinguishing between the formal and the informal, and there was no hierarchy or privileging of one group over another. Everyone was treated in the same manner, including the art historian David Jocelyn, who came and wrote about the work for Art Forum. We mapped the process and connections as a structure, as a line drawing, as a painting. And then we further mapped it with the institutions and location as an evolutionary process. It was the Korean artist Nam Jun Paik, father of video art, who emancipated video from television. Paik understood the technical aspects of television and broadcasting, and in 1974 coined the term the <laughs> electronic superhighway to talk about how electronic telecommunications would be socially and economically more significant than the landing on the moon. What he wrote came true. Pike knew that what was possible to do with the snow on a screen from an unused television channel he turned it into a video work. Artists can also serve as focal points for the ethical imagination, a term that was coined by my friend, the Kenyan writer Yvonne Adyambo Uwoor, the creative impulse that engages real world concerns that are of consequence. When she said that combination of words, it made everything open up and seem possible. We are presently working on public utility 2.0 in Nairobi with a local partner, the Kwani Trust. That work actually started with prototype 180 and the question of how to develop a low-cost wireless mesh network in an underserved area. 
I wanted to return to why I began with Soul Train that taught the majority of Americans how to dance and also dress. The work that we started and that continues is how to architect the spectrum of unused radio frequencies. The opportunity was realized in New Orleans as a commission for Prospect 3 under the direction of Franklin Sermons, who is now the director of the Paris Art Museum in Miami. The site was the American Institute of Architects Center on Lee Circle that fortunately is now having the statue of General Lee being removed and it will soon be renamed. As I mentioned at the beginning of this talk, if you are above a certain age in this room, and when you would be flipping through channels to find a show like Soul Train or Marty Hartman, Marty Hartman, and you would encounter screens with static, when you would see nothing being broadcasted, those UHF and VHF channels were unused television spectrum. This spectrum map architects the national resource of unused spectrum. When TV went digital, that real estate became available it is important that some portion of that space remains unlicensed by every nation in the world. As you can see, the upper area is Wi-Fi, and in comparison at the bottom is the unused television spectrum, or super Wi-Fi. Licensing or selling off all that spectrum would be like selling naming rights to the Grand Canyon or our national seashore. It is a pub, the public's property, like a public utility. Wi-Fi is used to make the case for super Wi-Fi, as Wi-Fi was considered the garbage frequency, as it was used for your microwave oven, baby monitor, garage door, or etc. Look at what happened when they left it unlicensed. It is embedding in everything, and I'm not talking about the Internet of Things as the, at this juncture. When the urban planner Robert Moses designed the highway system across the lower part of the U.S., Interstate 10 was brought into the center of New Orleans. In 1964, it divided and destroyed the historical black neighborhoods of Tremie and the 7th and 9th wards through the process of eminent domain used to pave the way for the buildings, building of the overpass for the highway. Conventional urban planning and renewal would prescribe taking that overpass down, but it will not reconnect those communities as vital as they once were in the 60s before the destruction. That area and the space is now an informal amphitheater that gets used for the staging of Mardi Gras, a workspace for the Mardi Gras Indians, a rehearsal space for the marching bands in New Orleans, and also a higher ground and dry space for the homeless population when they cannot find or have access to shelter. Public Utility 2.0 propositionally demonstrated that by shifting from the street plan to the elevation of these radio frequencies, Public Utility 2.0 can connect underserved communities. And an underserved or under-resourced location may be a rural lo location where an ISP or YSP or municipality cannot reach. Or it is an urban area that is deemed economical or physically, or physically not viable for trenching and cabling, and hence redlining occurs. We have seen this happen in New York, in the NYCHA, public housing, and the Bronx. Part of what we realized early on is that this is so early in terms of the number of people that understand the policy issue related to access and these national frequencies, so the architecting also involved the development of the narrative that included the map of the available spectrum as well as the development of the technology. <laughs> these are the prototypes that we developed with the RISE Wireless Network Lab for these software-defined radios that provide broadband wireless, long-distance, low-cost access. 
We also had a model of the section of New Orleans where we had the experimental license from the FCC to use the frequencies from 500 to 700 megahertz. And we invited the public and community leaders and business and anyone who could literally create a program within that space. WWOZ became a partner in the entire process. Architecting connectivity is as important as other utilities, as it is a social justice issue, but it is also a method for people to have a voice and presence in this ever more connected world. Our research team looked at the development of infrastructure and the public financing. We started with the interstate system for the highways and how that with the space program channeled monies into certain parts of the country and then other utilities and economic development followed and it ended with the present. We use Twitter for this as broadcasting system as that it is what it is and is good for as long as it exists to tell the history and this was done every hour on the hour from 9 to 5 for the duration of the exhibition. And it still continues as we do pilots and demonstrations in the US and other parts of the world. Public Utility 2.0 continues wherever there is an underserved community and it involves policy, technology and architecting and network and program that can be replicated anywhere in the world, barring that there is not a policy that prevents access to the spectrum. I've done a great deal of work in the sphere of public policy, art and architecture in the public realm. It can be hard to quantify what the results are, but artists understand potentiality. We have the ability to work under the radar with unsuspecting materials, extract their latent power and transform them. When we are successful, we make visible something that previously had gone unseen. And this included the two-way transmittal of sound pieces from the Rauschenberg's fish house to the oyster beds in the bay in front of Cap Tiva. I want to conclude with the most recent work that was completed here in Berlin and with thanks to the American Academy for the time to make this possible and its planning and realization as things are never as simple as they appear and to also present the work by another artist who will be coming to Berlin. How is it possible to make a city visible in itself, to itself? What process will provide a provisional platform that literally reveals the complexity of space and being a part of a population where 10% of the population is local and the other 90% is comprised of nearly 200 nationalities? The Circle Game, a commission from Alza Kahl Avenue as a work of art interrogates these questions and propositionally sets up the conditions for there to be answers made by the individual, be that as a local, a foreign residence, or even a tourist. The shift in elevation also makes it possible to have a 360 degree view of the city, providing a comprehensive view. It provides a physical understanding of the city and points to its origins in Deria, a location that lies behind the downtown and the Burj Khalifa, and perhaps this intimates its return. al Quos is now seeable, and one physically understands the lateralization and how the skyscrapers become anomalies to the rest of the, of the metropolis, expanding into the, into the cultural as well as the social realm. One sees in a similar manner how Midtown and Wall Street have clusters of skyscrapers and Dubai is not dissimilar with its downtown and most notably the Burj Khalifa and then the marina area. The circle game as a structure and permanent commission at Al Zakal Avenue is instrumental in the ev evolution of Dubai to see itself through the privileging of culture and its production wherein one co-belongs by engaging their ethical imagination through the singularity of the work of art within the urban context. The site for the work is in the middle of this industrial complex that has become mixed with culture and is effectively zoned as such. 
It is the As Al Zakal family and Abdel Monem Al Zakal who envisioned such a place in Dubai. This drawing is a plan that was to be built as a three dimensional structure to provide a platform from which it is possible to see oneself within Al Zakal Avenue, thereby within Dubai. As a permanent part of the commission, two channel letter LED signs were erected. When did you arrive? And when will you return? If a work of art is to be considered as a structure, as amateur, its use value is further enhanced through the series of colloquy that will engage a variety of actors on the city to write act three in a play of an indeterminate length, thus creating cultural capital and the oral history. This was started with the partners of Oma, Iyad, Al Saka and Rainer de Graaf, the present and the future of the firm started by Rem Kohlhaas. Retrofitting is finally considered as mode of architecting. They too said that they are not political. Maybe talking about working on the infrastructure, which they all talk about, both parties. Oh, we, the crumbling infrastructure, we've got to fix it. Well, you know. Pay somebody to fix it instead of pay somebody to go to war. It has really become insane and no one is talking about peace. I don't want to live in a world without peace. Almost. 1,843 is the number of days since the, the start of the Syrian war. Every day at noon, there is a performance by the Syrian artist Isam Kobai that takes place when Kobai or another person light a match that, together with all the other matches, become an image of the fence that encircles the camp. It is representative of the number of days that the conflict continues. This work, as a form, realizes or materializes an ethical imagination. It is titled, Another Day Lost, 1,843 days as of today, and counting. The first civil uprising was on March 15, 2011. The title is taken from when the Lebanese singer Fayrouz sang the words, Gaba Naharun Akar, Another day lost, a ballad about the time that is irretrievable for the Palestinians living in exile. When Isam Korbai watched his country descend into chaos, he thought how the same is true for the Syrians. His work is literally constructed from abandoned material, books and discarded objects that are selected and utilized to construct the structure of a city that takes its form as that of a refugee camp. As he noted, I have not been, but I imagine it like Satari in Jordan, a pharmaceutical box for the psychotropic diazepam, Valium, is placed next to a page torn from a travel guide to Syria. As a form of a city, his work too occupies public space and has been exhibited in London, New York and the UAE. As the conflict continues, so does the work. Its next iteration will be in Berlin. Recently, I was asked how I could go from disco to asylum in one big swoop. I believe the person was really wanting to ask how I dare to do so. To this I reply, because I can. And because it is the reality of simultaneity and of so much that is not transparent. Of our own necessity, perhaps? Corby does not see his work as nihilistic. It is merely a part of our existence. 
things can become another, and they will. Corby also stated that he is not political. But what he has stated explicitly is the incomprehensibility of this atrocity of war and how our complicity is made visible as a form. It is the non-transparency of this statement that makes it transmittable. And here's that disco song, and let's hope that the world does not end.
So please feel free to follow up with questions and comments. Thank you. There should be a mic somewhere. There's a question over there or a comment. Maybe stand up. The, the acoustics are really bad, and without a mic, it's hard for me to understand. Can I say that the concept of Le Corbusier is still alive in such a uh, dialectical relation between society, political, critical, political, society, to a voice from a dragon queen? in the situation we have in the different cities we all show. Oh, that's a nice one. To, to queer, to queer Corbusier. Um, I think that the, the, probably the biggest difference between those were that Corbusier had this universalist humanist view. And he was not, I mean, what he, the way he built in India, for instance, highly problematic. So I would say that they're coming from different positions as to the individual and humanness. But other than that, I would say, yeah, I mean, in this way of thinking of architecture as a material through which to you, to, to read and also interact with and, and form. The social, yes. yeah. yeah. Okay. And also with the meaning of how to deal with the uh, situation <coughs> and with the life of the people who live on it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what... Um, when I grew up, my father took me to this um, Baroque park in uh, Castle Schwetzing. And it had a really interesting um, structure that uh, you couldn't come close. It was basically, um, um, you had to look through a vista of trees and then you could see the Bay of Naples. Yes. And he, and it was really, right there, he took me around and he showed me the wall that actually this was painted on. It was a trompe d'oeil. And he said, this is the end of the world. <coughs> I was thinking about that when I was re-reading re re on the, pro you know, thinking about re-reading on the prototype 180 on Mary Ellen's prototype 180, and um, what I found really interesting about this concept is that she, you know, when she's saying she's turning around this building and then, so she's really making a small switch 180 degrees to connect the public to the pu public and that this work is ongoing and then it will retrofit not only the environment around the building, the architectural structure, but then going on into the public realm. That it's almost like um, Piero Manzoni's 1962 plinth that he put somewhere and said this was the plinth of the world, of the globe. You know? So it's in a way really envisioning, it's such a, it's such an, strong and radical. It's not just a house that is being turned around. It's really a, a beginning of affecting the whole world by this um, artistic practice. You know, this is a, a utopian. It has a utopian dim dimension. And I find that so very interesting in her artistic practice that she has on the one hand this really radical artistic utopian practice and on the other hand she's really working with people 
actual people and doing things that actually influence the world. So, and these are never put one on one. It's like there's a border between these two. So the realm of art and the realm of the world. And she's piercing the border between them, but she's not dissolving them into each other. Well, what do you think is this, why this happened? I, I'm asking you. <laughs> well, the talk was very long. <laughs> um, I think it was also, hi. <coughs> I think it was also um, quite complex and certainly not uh, performing the artist as one usually is expecting that the artist will be performed. Uh, here I am standing, and who's not in the room? <laughs> 